So today we're continuing our series uh, on the I am statements, as Justin mentioned earlier. And our subject for, for this particular message is, is the statement, I am the gate, from, John, uh, from the passage that we just read. And to, to start off this morning, there are a lot of cultural things that, that I need to, to break down before we get too far into this. So I'm going to back up to chapter 9. So if you, are, if you have your Bible at home or your Bible with uh, us for the, the 15 of us here this morning, the 50 of us here this morning, anyway, um, go ahead and open it up to, to John chapter 9 and we'll, we'll run through that here. There we go. <clears throat> From John chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as, as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him began asking, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Uh, first of all, this is not a cure for coronavirus. I don't recommend spitting in your neighbor's eyes. Um, <coughs> I just want to throw that out there. Um, but and then at this point, we see a really interesting interaction between the, the man that's just been healed and Jesus and, and the Pharisees who are, uh, are, who are the, the leaders of the synagogue in the town. And they, they bring him in for questioning because all of a sudden, this man who used to sit and beg is seeing. And, and they're wondering what happened. And so they bring him in and they question him about it and they don't like his answers. So they bring in his parents because, you know, hopefully the parents will give an honest answer. And even they say, you know, trust our son. He's an adult, but he was definitely born blind. Um, and the, the Pharisees don't want to listen to it. They don't want to hear what he has to say. And so they bring him in again. And that brings us to verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they, ins they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly, the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of, the, of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Um, if anyone ever came to Justin or I with a miraculous healing or a miraculous blessing, um, and we threw that person out because we didn't believe it, uh, they would probably be pretty, pretty frustrated, pretty mad. That's probably the understatement of the year. Um, but beyond that, the people around them would also instantly stop trusting the church. There, there's so much... Uh, that, that one action like that can do. There's so much trust that can be lost in, in insulting one person and in insulting one family. And so Jesus doesn't let the Pharisees off the hook. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he, fa or when they, yeah, when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. 
but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Uh, the context that we're given for this particular I am statement, for this particular uh, declaration of, of God and who he is in Jesus Christ, is one of deep corruption. We see the, the supposed church people, the Pharisees, who are supposed to be serving as the people's spiritual leaders. We see them fall into to the deepest levels of greed and, and just completely turn on their community. They're mo more focused on retaining their own power, on retaining the, the responsibility and, 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 and authority they have over people's lives than they are in actually serving the people that they were sent to serve. I mean, imagine if, if pastors acted like this. Imagine if, if you came to Justin or I and, and, and you wanted our help with something, if you wanted us to, to pray over you or bless you in some way, and, and all we were worried about is whether or not you were giving us money. Uh, you'd probably turn tail and run pretty quick. Um, and I wouldn't blame you, because that's not how we're called to operate. But yet, we each do this in our own way. We each struggle to, to see those around us as people in need of God's love and care, despite all of the, the, the things that are going on around us. When, when, we, uh, when we see people around us, we make snap judgments about who they are. And, and we build our entire interaction with them off of that immediate judgment. We don't give them time to be the neighbors that we love. Instead, we just make them our enemies. And it only increases the cycle of hate and, and, and frustration and division that this world continues to see. For me, this is a very personal topic because growing up, um, I was what I would call excessively confident. Um, and my, my parents would back this up. Uh, I thought that I was always right. Um, and that the people that I dis disagreed with on anything were always wrong. Uh, and no matter how informed they were on anything, no matter if that was their specialty, if they should have known right, I still thought I was right. And it broke a lot of my relationships. I didn't see it at the time, though, because they weren't my close circle of friends. And so it kind of tore down a lot of relationships that I don't have anymore. And it saddens me quite a bit. Because when I got to college, I, I had a new circle of friends. And the, their ideas were a lot more diverse. Their opinions were a lot more diverse. And so when, when I started to become that pompous kid that I'd always been, it backfired. Because suddenly I was surrounded by people who were as set on their opinions as I was. Those people who, who uh, were as strongly set in their beliefs as I was. And I started to see the impact that my actions had had in my life because I was getting the same thing done to me. I could see the anger and, and judgment in people's eyes as I talked to them. I wasn't their friend anymore. I was something, and I, I was an idea that needed to be rooted up and destroyed. And it hurt. It broke me. I didn't want to be an enemy. I wanted to be able to have these conversations with the people that I cared about. But there was too much standing in the way. I knew that I had to set an example. That I had to open up and I had to listen to those who were around me. And if I didn't do that, there was no chance of a conversation going anywhere. And if, if I couldn't even stop and listen to people about topics that oftentimes were frankly pretty dumb, there was no way that I was going to be able to tell them about the love of Christ. I hope that as you're hearing this this morning, if, if this is something you know you struggle with, and I, I know that more of you struggle with than you probably think, I hope you think about the way that you enter into conversations. That, that agenda needs to come down. The, the combative nature that we all have in, in some of our conversations needs to come down. Because that's ultimately not our role. That's exactly the same sin 
that the, the Pharisees were falling into in this, in this passage. They were judging this man. They were judging Jesus because of what they thought the world should be and what they thought was right. We'll jump back into the text. From John 10, 1 to 6, we'll see how Jesus responds to the Pharisees in more detail. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought, the, brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. I'm not going to dive into this too, too much because it's going to overlap with what Justin's going to preach on in a couple of weeks. But I do want to say that the Pharisees would have recognized this analogy. They would have known what shepherds were. There were plenty of sheep in the area. They also would have known that this was an analogy that had been used throughout the Old Testament to describe the work of God, especially in the, in the prophets or in, in classic Psalms, like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. They would have known what this meant and yet it still stumped them. These guys were supposed to be experts. And that brings us back to what we read earlier. And I want to focus especially on the last two verses of of that reading that I read a few minutes ago. From verses 9 and 10 of chapter 10. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out. They will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The gate that Jesus compares himself to is the gate of a sheep pen. And at that time, the sheep pens were essentially just stone circles. They had thorns around the top to keep thieves and robbers out and keep the animals in. There was only one way in and out, and that was through a gate. Ultimately, what Jesus is doing here is he's telling the Pharisees that they weren't the ones with authority to judge. That there is only one way by which God's sheep enter his care, and that's through the gate. He was the only life, the only, the, the only way that they could connect with the Father. It wasn't any of their customs or laws. It, it was just him. And so Jesus tells the church leaders of his day, among other things, that they are blind, lying to themselves, incapable of knowing what's going on. He calls them thieves and robbers. He tells them that they have no authority over these people's lives. They never have, and they never will. Because they're just like sheep. Just like everyone else. And the same goes for us. As people of God's church, we often look at our neighbors and start to assume things. We make judgments about them. We start to assume that, that we know what's better for, for ourselves and for them. Uh, we, we start to, to have this air of authority because we either think we're right, we might even be right, but it doesn't matter because that's not our position to judge. That's not the place that God set us into because God knew from the beginning as the people of God's church, that, that we would fall, that we would be broken, that, that we would need his help. He knew no, that no matter how obvious he made himself to his people, no matter how many battles he brought them through, famines, uh, exiles, plagues, that they wouldn't see him for who he was and that they would fall away time after time. So instead of trying to show them these big acts of of glory, he came down as an infant. He came down as God's only son in Christ. He came down to, to bring life and love and forgiveness to a judgmental and broken world. A, a world blinded by our own sin. He came that so that every sin, no matter how small, no matter how significant, was paid for by his sacrifice on the cross. So that none of us, 
would owe a debt to the Pharisees or Satan or even death. And in his rising, we have life. In his resurrection, we enter through that gate. The world that we we find ourselves in right now is a world of fear and panic. And as we struggle with the ongoing effects of the coronavirus, uh, we're also presented with an immense opportunity to acknowledge our blindness. Uh, In the midst of all of that panic and fear, cleaning products are are flying off shelves, disinfect every possible surface. Uh, But the truth is, no matter how much Lysol we use, we're probably gonna die. It, It might not be because of this virus. Hopefully it's not. But eventually, we're all going to pay the price for our sin. But in that reality, we look to Christ. When we admit our blindness, when we admit the fact that we judge others for the way that we're acting in the midst of chaos and fear and panic, when we step back and let God take control of our lives, it doesn't matter if the virus impacts us or our family, or our community. Because Christ is there through it all. He is there giving us life and hope in the midst of death that terrifies all of us. I pray and I encourage you over the next several weeks as as we continue to to deal with this uh, pandemic that you wouldn't respond with fear. That you wouldn't let fear drive you to judgment but that instead you would speak life and love and care, that you would show people the gate that is Jesus Christ and that you would bring them through that gate to his life and love that he promises to all of us who believe in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we come to you broken people We come to you knowing our need for you and the love that you have poured out for us on the cross. We pray that in the midst of times of panic, in the times of fear that we currently live in, that you would lift us up, that you would crown us with with the crown that you have waiting for us, of glory, of life, of an eternity spent with you, so that we can show that love, that life that you, you pour out us excessively to those around us. Because in the midst of this fear and this panic, you have called us to serve our neighbors, to love our neighbors, to not judge them. Help us to be the church and not the Pharisees. Amen. At this time, we're going to move into a time of confession. And this morning, I want you to reflect especially on those things that... that cause you to judge, the the things that you are afraid of, the things that, that draw you away from where God is calling you in life. And so if you, like me, have struggled with judging your neighbors, with judging your family, your friends about the things that they believe, and whether that fits into the perfect mold of God's church, then cast that aside with me and confess, yes, I have. Yes, I have. It is my joy this morning to remind you of the work of Christ, to remind you of how his love has overcome even our worst sin, even the worst of our brokenness is bound up in his love. And so go this morning, knowing that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.